The word church in uh, Greek, uh, some of you know it. If I say ek, you're going to say ekklesia. A lot of us know actually more Greek than we, than we realize because we use it in English and in Spanish. Uh, so understand that ecclesia is part of two words, which means ek meaning out. And you can see the exit signs that we have that uh, have the X on it, and that means out. Kaleo means called. So think of kaleo, calling, right? So the church is the called out ones. We're called out for a purpose. We're called to follow a God that the world does not follow, a God that the world does not recognize. We're called to follow the Creator God. And the baptism that you just saw with Paul is is a public statement about willingness to follow the Creator God. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has a set of beliefs that it is interested in letting people know about. More than that, it's interested in letting people know that we love Jesus. We are very interested in loving Jesus, and we're very interested in being ready for his second coming. He came one time, and he's promised that he's going to come again. And he said there are going to be some things happening in the world when he comes again. Okay? And if we're watching, we can see that a lot of those things are happening in our world right now. So... Not going to say that it's going to be tomorrow. Not going to say it's going to be next week or next year. What I am going to say is that the things that Jesus said about the future are coming true, and that means it's soon. Now, how do you want to define soon? The Adventist Church has been saying soon for over 160 years. So how do you define soon? Here's Paul. Paul and his mom have you know, known about and been part of at various times, the Adventist Church. Paul, you went to San Fernando, right? San Fernando Academy, he went there. Um, uh, and then he also, you went for a year to PUC, yeah? So Paul knows about the structure, shall we say, of the Adventist Church and the education system that we have. He participated in it. Um, and then, then you met... A beautiful woman. She's sitting right there, right? Okay. And, and you said, whoa, don't think I can do life without her. So he married Alex. And Alex, really, really glad that you're here. Uh, we, we are so happy that the whole family is here, that you are representing what has happened. Mom? Dad? Okay. Um, look, at, look at what happened. Okay. Paul? Brothers? Cousins, sister, sister. yeah, I mean, we're here, we're here today because of what God has done in our lives. We're alive today because he has kept us alive. And so we're very glad that you have come to celebrate that. I'm going to ask if the goodies can be brought. We have a few things for you that we're going to give even before we take a vote. How's that? Okay. We, we, we get to do a vote thing. Oh my goodness, look at that picture. So worth it, right? <laughs> That's awesome. That is awesome. You guys were amazing. Was that 70s or 80s? Okay, all right. 80s. 80s? Okay, you're not that old. Alex, we wanted to make sure that you, that you got flowers. How many of you want to say thank you to Alex for being a great wife? Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much. We don't want to, don't want to embarrass you, but I definitely think they want pictures. So, okay. She's saying, okay, thank you. That's enough. <laughs> she, she is a wonderful person who has taken good care of us when we've gone late into the night talking. We, we also want you to share this with your family. It's a few books and a few goodies. Uh, thank you so much for deciding that this congregation is where you want to have your membership as a part of the worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church. We accept 
the responsibility of inviting people into membership. It's the superpower of the local church. The conference doesn't do this. The union doesn't do this. The division, the general conference doesn't do what you're about to do. So on behalf of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Paul has asked for membership in the Adventist Church. So I'm going to ask you as the members today, uh, is there a motion? This is, there's a motion. Is there a second? There's a second. All in favor, please raise your hand and go, yay, Paul. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> okay, this is, this is an amazing day. It's a day that uh, has been looked forward to and... We are grateful for the, the, the broad shoulders and wisdom of this man as he is deciding to, to put his shoulder to the wheel for the mission and ministry of this church, and we're grateful for that. Let's, let's just have a word of prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, you have prepared this day from long ago, and uh, we're going to say the stuff that happened in the past is the past, and we're grateful that you have hung on to Paul and that you have hung on to each and every one of us till this day. And so we ask that uh, you would lead Paul and his family. We ask that they would feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives and that the angels would continue to protect and bless them. This is our prayer today and always for the Velasquez family with Paul as the, the leading father in this family as he leads his sons and his daughters and grandsons and granddaughters and as he his wife stands beside him and with him I just pray God that that they will be a light in their community for what it is to be a God-fearing family for these and other blessings we thank you in the name of Jesus amen amen, amen. okay you want you want a picture this is this this is the picture right here this is the certificate if you want to if you want him to share that with you he can because in there are statements of belief about various subjects, and we're just really, really grateful. Paul, welcome. Oh, thank you so much. Welcome, absolutely. You will have the opportunity after the service. We call it the right hand of fellowship. It's an old tradition. So just go up to Paul and say, welcome uh, to the family. All right? Okay. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. All right. I am reading Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 through 12. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said... In what way shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? You are cursed with a curse. You have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you much blessing, there will not be enough room to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, and you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of the host. Amen. It's my omission that Paul Cardi's name is not in, the, in your bulletin, but understand that today is going to be about us, and we're going to be talking about the subject, your money is your life. Now, you would think, oh my goodness, he would probably need to choose a better subject for a day when Paul and his family would be here for the first time. However, I think that it is a most amazing subject because I do believe 
that the money that we carry around, that we get paid on payday, represents time that you will never get back. It's a piece of your life that somebody has put a value on. <laughs> yes, exactly, Mom. It's hilarious to think how little value sometimes we feel that our life is. Because people may say, oh, you're just a serving person at, at, at Jersey Mike's. So we're only going to pay you, okay? Or you're a, a maxi facial surgeon. We're, we're going to pay you. You see what I'm saying? So there is a system that we live in in this world that puts a value on your life. You just heard a text read that is traditional in the talking about money in, in church and particularly the idea of tithe. Understand that the point that we're going to make so that we're going to be good preachers, we're going to tell you what we're going to tell you and then we're going to tell you and then we're going to tell you what we told you. You got that? Okay, so what we're going to tell you is that this text, although it sounds really kind of mean and, and like God is saying, you're robbing me, is basically God saying, you know what? I've given you life, and I only ask that you recognize that I have given you life and health and strength, and the way that I want you to recognize that is by returning your tithe to me. And he had a designated way of doing that in the Old Testament, and we have a designated way of doing that in this denomination, if you like, in this Christian church. We have a designated way that we do this, okay? But, nonetheless, it's the action that we are talking about today. And so, really, on this day where Paul has demonstrated his relationship with God and said, I am together with God, I want you to know that every Sabbath, and now online, you have the opportunity to demonstrate it's a physical thing that you do, whether it's tapping it out on your phone online, or whether you're writing a check, or whether you're getting bills out of your billfold, it is a physical thing that you're doing to say, this, this piece of paper that represents money, which is the, the currency that goes around and around, which I spend on things and which people give me for the time in my life, I am taking part of this thing that represents my life and I am giving it back to God because He asked me to do this as a way of recognizing that He gives me everything. Everything that I have, everything that I, that I am, comes from him as the creator God. So that's the basis. That's really the basis. And I, I, I guess, uh, I, as, as Paul and I talked, I said, look, let's, let's just put it out there that this is what we're talking about. And it may, it may seem strange on a day with the baptism, but really it's not because we're talking about our lives here and, and then this idea of, of, of money. Uh, it's based on the fact that we believe in God, right? Um, if you don't believe in God, then you're really not required to pay tithe, are you? So if you do believe in God and you do participate in a relationship with him, then this topic today, and particularly the text in Malachi, recognizes that relationship and says, okay, here is how you can recognize your dependence upon God in a physical way. Uh, and, and Paul, I just wanted to start this out by saying uh, there's a particular word that comes in this text which I want to emphasize, and that is the word increase. How many of you would like to see more in your pocket this year than you did last year? Or let's just say enough in your pocket to pay the bills. Yes? So you need an increase in order just to stay alive. We talk about inflation, all that kind of stuff. This is the word increase. And basically God says, I'll make a deal with you. I'll give you an increase if you recognize that it was me that gave it to you. 
Does that make sense? So he says, I would like you to tithe on your increase. So let's just go back to the Old Testament for one small second and say, I have a hundred sheep. If none of my ewes in my flock gave birth in that year, would there be an increase? I'd still have a hundred sheep. But God says, the first lamb from every ewe that gives birth, the first lamb is mine. You can read it. It's part of what is in Leviticus. So the tithe, as it were, for your herd, your flocks and herds, was the firstborn of every, every animal. So that's how they did it with animals. We say, okay, so I get a check. What's the first thing I'm going to do with that increase? I'm going to say, first thing is I'm going to recognize that God is the one who gave me that increase, and therefore I'm going to return to him what some Hebrew scholars would call the very least of the things that you can do. Because in Hebrew you count with letters. The numbers are actually letters. And the tenth number in the tenth letter in the Hebrew alphabet, which is also the number ten, is the yod or the jot. We talk about the jot and the tittle, okay? It's the tiniest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So the rabbis say, hey, you know, it's the least, it's the least we can we can do is give ten back. So that's the setting. Um, I've had some number of conversations with Paul about this, and he's, I'm going to say, you're a businessman, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. How, how has this come across to you as a person who is looking for an increase in your business? As far as your, yes, as far as your relationship with God, and you know, what, what has this helped you, what has this helped you to, uh, to do? So I get to talk for a few minutes here? You're up. That was a joke, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Me and him go back and forth sometimes on some of this stuff. And on the racquetball court. So. Um, okay, so going back a ways, um, I did not have God in my life. I was not raised around the church. My parents were, but they chose in an early adult age to kind of go the other way and not raise their kids around the church. So I was raised... With all the other kids, the way we all get raised when we go to public school and we, we figure it out, we figure the world out. My parents are good people. They have very good hearts. They just chose not to bring that element of a religious understanding or upbringing into it for me. Fine. So I turned, off, turned out to be a pretty self-centered little cuss, as they call it. <laughs> And not, not in a bad way, it's just this is the default, I think, in the world. You know, we, we worry about ourselves kind of first and foremost until we find a, a calling or a yearning or something that's inside that, that is, is pulling us towards trying to figure out, is it really more than all, all about us? And so I was listening to that as I got older, as my, I got married, and we had three kids and small kids, and I just didn't really know what all these... Christian people were always this excited about. I was pretty skeptical about it all. But um, I, I, I ran into a group of uh, other guys, some of which who were businessmen, who were, in, in the way I looked at the world, very successful in life. And they had walks with this God. And so something in the, that era of my life told me, why don't you just be quiet for once, Paul, and listen and search and figure it out for yourself instead of just always pushing back nicely. Oh no, I'm not interested in that. So that was the beginning and over the course of the last 25 years in deciding to read the Bible for myself with a group of other Christians who in many cases, you know, were way ahead of me in their knowledge but helped me to see the basic concepts of what's going on in God's message in the book. That it's not about, you know, pounding religion over our heads at all. It's about us finding God. 
He's already got us in his hands, but we have to turn first of our own free will and have some faith to go find this mysterious God, right? So over the course of time, that softened my heart enough Mm -hmm. that it has helped me in my dealings with people. Business is people at the end of the day. That's right. Um, Relationships. And that has manifested itself into looking back, lots of good decisions now, things that have really panned out pretty well for myself and my family. Um, And each time those little things happened at every corner, um, I just internally, very solemnly acknowledged God. I don't talk about it a lot with people. Um, Talking about money in a congregation is very uncomfortable. I specifically have learned for myself, and I don't believe that we need to have our pastor talking about it directly. I think it's awkward. It is. I think it should be us lay people who talk to each other about the need for carving out a spot in your life and in your budget and in your, in your you know, the way you run with God, so to speak, for uh, giving back, acknowledging his helpfulness in your life in terms of you getting financial gain for your time and giving a little piece of that back. In this case, this local church benefits when people give back. We have a lot of you sitting here who I know very specifically do an awful lot to make this church work, not only financially, but with your time and your energy and your efforts. That's right. That works in every congregation. That's how it works. Churches are not businesses. We don't make a product you walk in here and buy. Hopefully a service is not supposed to be so entertaining that you feel compelled to give more today because he made you feel so good about his sermon. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're hard news, right? So that's how it's helped me, Mike. Um, First turning to God, first developing a faith walk, then developing um, an attitude, I guess, for carving a piece of our financial lives out and giving it back happily not out of obligation you know some of the stuff in the old testament is pretty obligation sensitive it's pretty you know Mm -hmm. god's laying it on you You have to do this or Mm -hmm. else i don't buy that stuff Mm -hmm. i just don't like that (laughs) it doesn't roll with my personality style i would rather joyfully go in and do something Mm -hmm. because it would be a hundred times better coming out the other end that way sure absolutely well uh, corinthians corinthians tells us god loves a cheerful cheerful giver and um, again, the, the, the only reason why I laid the basis that I did was because it would, it would be much nicer in a relationship with God to be cheerful about it rather than be feeling like, you know, why, is, why does he need, he, he doesn't need my money, he doesn't need my time, he's got all these other resources at his disposal, but so, so why would he need mine? And so that's why I think this is a very intensely personal action, uh, decision, attitude, these are words that you've used, that are, are great, that we decide this is the kind of relationship that I want to have with my God. Uh, I want to recognize him, want to do so cheerfully and lovingly. Uh, you've talked a lot about the local. Um, we have a tithe envelope in front of you if you, if you, if you care to look at it. I, I don't look at it anymore because my wife uh, does the bills and she does them online. And so on our website, there is a place where you can do your giving if you want to do it through the church. Uh, just understand that this, this local church of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination uh, participates in a system, and that system is that tithe, this is where... Uh, Paul is absolutely right. It's difficult for a pastor to talk about tithing because I get paid with tithe. But our system is that we support a sisterhood of churches in what we know as the Southern California Conference. And so every penny of tithe that comes from this church is sent to the conference by our treasurer. And the conference then sends it out in the prescribed manner that we have all voted that it will be sent out. And that's, that's why I get a paycheck, is because people in this conference are 
faithful in returning their tithes through the venue, and this is a word that Paul and I talked about, that this is a venue for you to return your tithes. And I'm thankful, I'm just going to say I'm thankful that you do, all right? Uh, we pay tithe, I pay tithe as well, on the tithe that I'm paid with. So I participate in this system just like you do, okay? Uh, I also, in, in talking with Paul, we, we talked about the fact that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a worldwide perspective. And so I want you to know that not every penny of your dollar of tithe stays here in the Southern California Conference. It's actually about 25 cents on the dollar goes outside of the conference to other parts of the church in the world. So the conference gets some, the, actually the, the union, the division, and the general conference all get a piece of that tithe dollar for doing ministry in other parts of the world. So you can know, it's actually a piece that I want you to know, that for every tithe dollar that you return through the Adventist system that you are not only helping this local church by my services, but you are also helping other local churches in the Southern California Conference, and you can also say you're helping people far across the seas with that tithe dollar. And I don't know if you knew this, but I want you to know that because there are other times when we ask you for other offerings for specific projects. I want you to have in your mind, if you're paying a faithful tithe, that you are already participating in monies going far away, but that you're mainly participating in the ministry of the local church. So when you give, on the back of that envelope, the inside of that envelope, you designate how and where. That's right. There's two ways to give that, that benefit this whole organization. You give tithe, which goes up to the conference, like Mike said, and it is used for payroll to pay our pastors and our help. You give to your local church budget. That keeps the lights on, that keeps the grass mowed, that keeps the place looking good. And that's different from tithe. And that's different from tithe. Mm -hmm. You work it out with God how much and how you want to split that. Right. Okay? Collectively, though, when the majority of us are doing that, enough comes in and we don't have to talk about money. That's how I'd prefer it to be. But sometimes when it's not, and all you got to do is open your bulletin up and take a look at some numbers and stuff, um, we have to kind of bring it back up a little bit to make sure that people are aware that same as paying your rent at home and putting the lights on in your home and you know, parking lots have to be repaved every five years and the roof every 20 and it's a lot of stuff. This place is one big old house that just falls apart. And that is paid for by our local gathering of what our congregation and people are willing to give back. So make a piece, a place, you know, people march with their, their, their feet and they march with their wallets. Where you go is what's important to you. And what you spend your money on is what's important to you, okay? And so I think our point, without hammering it too hard, is to simply say God is asking us to make a place for him too in both of those areas. Not the whole thing either. Some small amount that you work it out, you work it out with him. <laughs> Not for us to tell you dollar amounts and all that stuff. You guys have to work that all out. You know what's in your heart. But if enough people do that, it's not an issue regarding the budget and the whole process of keeping a place physically here mm -hmm. and a pastor in place and all that stuff. When it gets too low, things get put in jeopardy. So, Just going to, in, in, in closing then, I'll just read this one piece from Malachi again. It actually says, and, and this might be amazing to some of you, but it actually says, test me. So this is God talking to you today. Test me. You don't think that this is really going to happen? Well, try me. Try me. And see if I... This is, this is now the God of heaven. <laughs> we look up into the sky, right? <laughs> we think he's up there when I think he's all around us. 
Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not even have enough room to store it. So uh, as, we, as we go to our homes today, as we, look, as we think about our lives, we think about the, the life and health and strength that God gives us every day, this, this reciprocal action is what we're thinking about. And he is saying to you, test me, see if I don't make your life uh, amazing, do things for you that you never thought possible uh, because you found that I do love you, I do take care of you, and that your relationship with me is important. He knows the hairs on your head. He knows exactly what's going on in your life, and we can trust him. Amen? Amen. Amen.